God's word reads like this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sins are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. May the Lord bless that, the reading of his own precious word. What we've, what we've noticed and what we've continually been reminded of in this journey of the book of Hebrews is this admonition which appears early on in the, in the epistle. It says, don't drift away. If you remember, or maybe, maybe it's a little too far back now for many of us to remember every sermon we've heard over the last seven months, but one of the earliest, one of the earliest sermons that we looked at in this book was about not drifting away. It was about the fact that, that in order to stay faithful to the gospel and living lives of righteousness, it takes an engaged, intentional effort. The author of Hebrews warns the readers, he warns us, don't be like that person that just kind of stabilizes yourself in a certain way of living and assume that you're going to remain there by the sheer fact that you once were there because the reality is with temptation, with sin, with the world, with the enemy that is the devil, Christians will drift Away. There's, there's a change of tone though, although that's been true and it has been important for us to be reminded of that time and again, when we pick up our text here in Hebrews chapter 13, we notice there's been a change. Don't drift away has turned into don't be led away. Don't drift away, and you can kind of see that person that, that, that they simply don't realize. They, they don't realize what's happening to them. When I, was a, when I was a young boy growing up in Australia, one of the things that every young boy and young girl learns in Australia is how to be safe in the beach or in the, in the ocean at the beach. It was, it was kind of mandatory. As part of our education, you would go to primary school and the teacher would take you along to the beach and you would learn basic safety because the beaches in Australia are deadly. Check it out. You'll love it. It's a great, great vacation. And a lot of times people get in trouble because they're unaware of the risks. I'm not just talking about sharks and stingrays and, and jellyfish. Yep, they're all there. Yes, that's the beach in Australia. I'm talking more importantly about what we call a riptide. And so, and so we would be taught this exercise as, as young kids. I remember being taught this. You would, you, the teacher would put a marker on the sand in the, in the beach, o- on the shore, and, and tell the class of students to wade out into the water, no farther than, than waist deep, and, and just hang out there and spend five minutes playing and wrestling and messing around in the water. And then after five minutes, the teacher will blow a whistle, and everyone looks back up at the flag, and inevitably, every single time, we were about 100 yards from the flag. That's the, that's the nature of the, of the movement, of the momentum of the water, of the ocean. Now, as, as young kids, and I'm talking five, six, seven-year-old kids, to us it was almost like magic. How is this happening? How is this happening? This can't be possible. And so, and so what we would do is we'd try and cheat the system, and, and we'd go out some distance into the water, and we'd keep our eye on the flag, and we'd pretend to be distracted and mess around, but we had someone spotting that flag the whole time so that we wouldn't move. And without any effort of our own, without any ingenuity of our own, you would always find yourself drifting. And that's very much the scenario of living this Christian faith, in this God-forsaking world. 
is that you may feel like you, you certainly may feel like you're at the exact same spot you were 12 months ago, six months ago, or 10 years ago, but until you've looked up and actually marked the distance you have drifted, you will have no idea the effect of the world on you. But more shockingly than that, the, the one that unwittingly, the, the, the one that unintentionally drifts away, the greater tragedy with a, without, without comparison is the one that's led away. They're led away. It's, it's not so much that it's happened to them, it's that they've allowed themselves to be influenced by dangerous, toxic, and heretical teaching. Now we go to this particular chapter in Hebrews, and we pick this up at verse number 8, as we'd already read. We see the first declaration that's made is Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That is, friend, that is really good news. That is stupendously good news. Because what that says is no matter how, how rough life gets, how murky, messy, and, and how strong the riptide in the ocean of life in this world is, Jesus is not moving. He remains the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. If you have detected in your heart a, a certain estrangement from Christ, a, a distance is growing from you and Jesus, your love is growing cold, your affections are not fervent, your fruit bearing, your obedience is, is now becoming lax and apathetic, He has not moved. If the distance is beginning to be shown between you and your Savior Christ, He is the same. He has remained. He is the flag in that sand, stuck firm, always marking the place of hope and salvation. And if you find yourself at a greater distance, at an increasingly greater distance, you are the one moving. He remains the same. The great news about this proclamation that Jesus doesn't change, that Jesus doesn't, he doesn't go from, from one stage of salvation or perfection to a, another, our Savior is perfect. What's, what's essential in a being that is perfect is immutability. It's, it's a fancy word for meaning the inability to change. If Jesus is perfect, and He is, then any variation or change in Christ would be a change from the better to the worse, from the greater to the lesser. You have a Savior. You have a Messiah. You have a Redeemer that is perfect and can never change. His mercy endures forever. I don't know about you, but I take a... I take an unusual delight in this. I don't know if it's just me. I don't know if I'm, if I'm unusual. I suspect I probably am. But I have this thought that, I have this thought that one day, because look, it, eternity, it's a really long time. And I'm, I'm a really big sinner. Maybe not you, most certainly me. And I have this thought, maybe even a fear, if I could just be real honest. It's, I have this thought that there's going to come one day in the distant eons of eternity where God's going to look at Craig and he's going to say, you know what, that guy, oh, he's a really big sinner. And I know, I know for millennia upon millennia upon millennia, I've just allowed his salvation to be free and final in the sacrifice of Christ. But I'm deciding to flip the script. I'm going to call him into account for the sins that he committed in his life. I know it's irrational. I know it's unbiblical. But where do I go when those thoughts begin to crop up in my own fascination, my, my own unbelieving heart? What promises do I stand upon that tell me that there is never coming a day Ever, not now, not in eternity to come, where God will call upon me to give an account for my sin. It is this promise right here. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And His salvation will never fail. And His perfection will never wax or wane or grow old. It is incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven for you 
who through faith are kept by the power of God. What a delightful promise it is for me. I have those moments where where I look at my heart and I look at my life and I think, there's no way God wants me on his team. There's no way God wants to save me. And if he does, it's got to be temporary. And the scripture reminds me and it reminds you that your salvation is secure. That your perfection in Christ is secure. Because if he cannot change, then your status of standing righteous before God can never change. The great news, in fact, the greatest aspect of the gospel that's been granted to us in the Scripture is that our salvation principally is an act of God that He does to us, for us, most importantly, outside of us. He saves us in Christ. He saves us through the objective reality that God sent forth His Son, born of the virgin woman, born under the law. That Jesus Christ came into our world, into this sin-sunken, God-defying world, and He lived perfectly, sin-free, without spot or stain of sin. The Bible says He was holy, harmless, undefiled. Then He went to that cross. And on that cross... He took off, as it were, he he took off his righteousness. He took off his perfection, as it were. He took to himself my failure, my sin, my reprobation. He took it off me. He wrapped himself in my inability, in, in my rebellion. And he died on a cross to pay every ounce of the penalty my sin deserved. And he took his righteousness and he clothed me in it. And that status of being perfected in Christ is unchanging and eternal. Because the Savior who saves me changes not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There are two things that the author of Hebrews wants to continually remind us of in this passage. The first one being the permanence of Christ. If He is your hope, if He is your salvation, if He is your redemption, then your salvation is secure because Christ doesn't change. The second thing the author wants us to to remember is not only the permanence of Christ, but the permanence of Christ's altar. We see that as we we go to our our Bibles here in Hebrews 13. We pick that up in verse 8, just the second half. It says, It is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Then it says in verse 10, We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. It goes on and talks about the bodies of those animals whose blood was brought into the holy place. Their body was burned outside the camp. Then it says in verse 12, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his blood. The good news of the gospel is that the person of Jesus is unchanging. He is the same. He is eternally safe and secure as the redeemer of God's people. The second great aspect of the gospel is the permanence of of the altar of Jesus. There's there's a contrast drawn here. I'm not sure if it occurred to you as we read it, perhaps it did. That that there's the Old Testament altar. There's that altar which animal after animal after animal after animal are sacrificed and bled and their bodies are taken outside the camp to be burned. And then the distinction, that, that, that contrast with Christ's altar that he is not bringing a lamb to God. Jesus is the lamb from God, and he comes before God outside the camp, on the cross, outside the city limits of Jerusalem, on Golgotha's hill. He dies, sheds his blood, and that altar is eternal. There's no addition. There's no complimenting. There's no supplementing the sacrifice of Christ. That has been a theme that we have encountered time and time and time again in this epistle. We come back to the admonition, verse 9. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. Do not be led away by strange and diverse teachings. Strange and diverse. It's kind of a strange and diverse way to describe false teaching. And I think there's a significant motivation as to why 
those words are used. So let's take a look at these two words that are described how, how people who in every outward way, they looked like Christians. They acted like Christians. They spoke like Christians. They walked like Christians. They lived outward lives of devotion like Christians do. There was no obvious discernible way to say that person will be led away by strange and diverse teachings. We take a look at these two words. The first one that's mentioned is diverse. The, the Greek word here is poikilos. It is a variety. It, it, the word means variety for variety's sake. Different, but not totally different so as to be non-recognizable. The kind of teaching that is, that is, that's a new spin, that, that's a new perspective, that's a, that's a different angle on a standard, stated, and historic doctrine. That's what the word diverse means. Not, not a whole new doctrine. You guys, are, you guys are savvy enough. Most Christians certainly are. Have, the, have sufficient theological nous to know when you're hearing a new doctrine. For the most part, Christians are not susceptible to that. The devil is vastly more witty. He's, he's vastly more intelligent. He has, he has more temptation power than what we often give him credit for. He doesn't come to you with a brand new doctrine that you don't recognize and you can dismiss. He comes with a new angle on an old doctrine, a new perspective on, a, on an historic truth that Christians have confessed for millennia. That's the first word. The, the second word, strange, Second word strange is, is, is xenos. It, it, it means foreign, new, different, diverse, and foreign teachings. One of the essential elements, this is, this is us going back to Christianity 101. One of the essential elements of the Christian faith is that, as we read in Jude chapter 1, it is the faith that was once for all delivered to the Saints, what that means is the revelation from heaven that was granted to Jesus and his apostles as the final word from God, that that is a faith that has been once for all delivered. We're not sitting back waiting for God to deposit upon his church another New Testament epistle, another account of Jesus' life, a new book, another testament, a new revelation. That is not Christianity. Our faith is that which is once for all delivered to the saints. That means that deposit of revelation that the apostles had in the first century is the Christian faith. The author of Hebrews puts it his own way in chapter 1. We've read this before. We come to it again, verse 1 and verse 2. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. The Christian faith is a once for all revelation from God. We have it in our Bible and it is certain and it is our bedrock and confidence of our faith. This is certainly true because Christians are led astray all the time because they don't have this fixed conviction that when Jude says to the churches that he wrote to, probably Ephesus, we don't exactly know who Jude was writing to, it seems like it's the church at Ephesus. Jude said to them, I wanted to write to you to speak about and encourage you in our common salvation. But instead, I found it needful to write to you to tell you to earnestly contend for the faith that is once for all delivered. It's been delivered. I remember some years back, I had this regular visitor at my home, and he was a Jehovah's Witness, and his intention was to convert me. That was his goal. I was very open about the fact that I reciprocated that goal. I wanted to convert him. We knew that of each other, but as he came by every few months to deliver his magazines, which I told him I don't read and I don't need, he kept bringing them, we developed a friendship. We, we developed something of a, of a camaraderie. 
We could respect that we disagreed with each other, but we could be certain and say that for us, love looks like for me to love you looks like me trying to change your mind. That's what it looks like. We were honest about it. And, and as we developed this friendship over many years, in fact, maybe three, four, five years, and, and I would move house. And, and as, as I would move house, I would, I would come under different jurisdictions of, of, of these witnesses that come and knock on your doors. And, and as I moved house, he would just kind of, he would put his name down to be my regular visitor so he could be my Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> I remember one particular occasion, and, and, and I, I, would, I would desperately try and con- convert him, convince him to challenge him. I remember one day, uh, he pulled up at the front of my house and he, comes across my front lawn, and he was a few years younger than me, not much. We were at about the same age, and and this particular morning, he's skipping over my lawn like he has just won the lottery. And I see him coming, and I think, well, he's in a very, a very good mood. And as he comes to my front door, he knocks, and I answer it, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking with him, and he tells me this. He says, you'll not believe how exciting news I have for you, Craig. He said, since the latest International Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses and the Bible Watchtower and Tract Society, I have now declared new truth. And it's being received. I looked at him with a curious gaze. What was wrong with the old truth? And I began to query, because my initial thought was that you know, if you know much about the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, they are a heretical, Aryan, pseudo-form of the Christian faith. They are not Christian. They are not our brothers and sisters. We love them to bring them truth, not to coddle them in their error so that they end up in eternal destruction. Just to put it out there really clear and plain. And the Bible Watchtower and Tract Society claims infallibility. Now, they don't want often be up front with that and explicit about that. But, but generally speaking, a Jehovah's Witness believes, if you've ever, you ever been a recipient of those magazines, the, the, the magazines that get delivered regularly to your home, I don't recommend you read them. They're mostly just junk. They're not worth your time. But they're there to convert you. Now, to a Jehovah's Witness, those magazines that are regularly produced by the Bible Watchtower and Tract Society in Brooklyn, New York, those magazines are as infallible as your Bible. They are not less than... They are equal to the revelation of God in Scripture. So so my aim with this young guy, and I cared about this guy, was to show him the sufficiency of Scripture. That is to say, when God inspired His holy prophets and apostles to write His Word in the Bible that we hold in our hand, it is enough. It's enough. It's God's Word. It's God's grace. It's God's deposit of His self-revelation, of His glory, His redemption, and His rule in the Bible. I try and tell him this, and he says, we've got new truth. I wondered initially, did he mean new ways of looking at their old truth? And he said, no, no, no. No, 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 no. The infallible Bible Watch Town Tract Society, these are my words, he wouldn't phrase it like this, so don't, don't lampoon me afterwards saying that was silly, they'd never phrase I know. But he essentially said this, the infallible organization has discovered brand new revelation, which if it contradicts the old truth, that's okay, because this new truth is true truth, that old truth is old, not so true truth. Are you confused? And I, I'm baffled because he wasn't not an idiot. This guy was not a simpleton. I was baffled because I, because I thought it was universally understood. I, I, I thought it was ubiquitous that people knew that if something is true, it's always true. It can't suddenly become true. Now, I'm not speaking of facts. I know we can discover facts that we didn't previously know or we can correct old I- I- misinterpretations. But as far as truth goes, as far as truth is... Truth is God and God is true. And what God knows as truth is eternally true. Universally so. I I remember speaking to this guy and I'm saying, what are you talking about? The JWs have declared new truth that's now being received. Now, don't get me wrong. That's the kind of thing you have to promulgate if you keep misprophesying the end of the world. Isn't it? 
Jesus is coming back. When? Next year. Did he come back? No. You know what, though? That was true, yes, but that was old true. You see, the new truth is coming back next year. Really? Doesn't come back? Did he come back? He didn't come back. Well, then it wasn't true. No, no, no. It was, true. It was the old true, though. Now we have a brand new, a brand, brand new, new true. That's the kind of foolishness and, and philosophical and, and, and epistemological suicide you have to commit if you're buying into a group that claims the Scripture is not enough. I don't need new truth. I've got God's truth in the Word that He spoke that is eternally, unchangeably true. So don't be led away by strange and diverse teachings. Don't be led away into thinking that if you have your Bible, but this guy around the corner or your neighbor next door has got an extra testament to his Bible or a new revelation or he's got, a, he's got brand new books that you don't have, that there's something wrong with your Bible, know that your Bible is God's Word sufficient in all things. Don't be led away. Don't be swooned by these people and compelled to, to think as they do. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There'll never be a discovery of doctrine today that was unknown to the apostles of Jesus Christ because the faith was once for all delivered in the age of the apostles. Any truth that comes to light now that was unknown back in those days is demonstrably untrue. We know that. The faith was once for all delivered. The faith is God's deposit in your Bible, in the Word. And Jesus is unchanging. His throne is eternal. There is no new faith. There is no new knowledge about the person, work, sacrifice, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't be led astray by either a new take on an old truth. This is a... This is a compelling one. Because a lot of Christians, they kind of have this fetish for something new. You've been in church long enough. You've been a Christian long enough. You've probably heard just about every sermon that's out there. And you've heard sermons on most of the Bible. And you attend cell group. And you attend Sunday school. And you're in Bible studies. You've been in the game long enough. You've heard most all of it. There's no doubt. That shouldn't discourage you. That shouldn't disappoint you. That should excite you. Now, don't get me wrong. Every line of Scripture, every verse of the Bible, every chapter of that holy book is of an infinite depth. No one has fully plumbed the depth of the Scripture of God. Don't misunderstand me. That's what eternity eternity will be for us. A forever growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Scripture and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be wrapped in joy and glory doing so. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying the Bible is a simple book. I'm not saying that every verse and chapter is just really clear on the surface. There's no digging and depth that's needed. Absolutely there is. I'm saying there's nothing that God wanted you to know that's not somewhere written in that book. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying any new prophets, organizations, or claimants to have revelation from God that augments that scripture is in some way, shape, or form a denial of what that scripture says. Another occasion, I didn't mean to tell these stories, but we shall anyway. I remember a couple of very well-dressed, very polite Mormons visited my home. Knocked on my door. I get blacklisted usually pretty early on. I'm not too sure what it is, but... They came around and they sat down and they, you know, you, if you've done this before with Mormons, you usually know how this goes. You're going to read a portion of the Book of Mormon and you're supposed to pray and wait for God to tell you that it's all true. And once you know that it's all true, now you're a Mormon. Okay, well, that's how it works. If you didn't know that, that's how it's coming for you when the missionaries find you. And so they began to tell me the story. Now, I'd done some study, like a lot of us, I'd, I'd done some background reading on Mormonism and apologetics to, to counteract and to answer their, to answer their objections to the, the historic Christian faith. And one of the things this missionary said to me is, you just need to learn more about the story of Joseph Smith. Now, to be honest and fair, most of what I'd learned about Joseph Smith was from kind of anti-Mormon sources that were fairly, fairly gritty and fairly negative in their appraisal of the man. I said, tell me. 
This man began to talk about the experience of Joseph Smith. He went around all these, all these different denominations and he couldn't find a church. And he went off into the, the forest one day and out there in the forest he has a vision. I'm sure many of you have heard this. I'm sure many of you have encountered this. And the young Mormon was talking to me and he said this. He said, the vision that Joseph Smith had, he saw with his eyes. There was Jesus walking with the Father. And I said, wait a minute, stop. Whoa, pump the brakes. Is Joseph Smith saying he saw the Father? Yeah, he, saw, he had a vision of the He saw the Father, yes. Before you go further, let's read a verse from the Bible, I said. We turn to John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. I said, are you telling me that John wrote chapter 1, no one's ever seen the Father at any time, but Jesus is the full manifestation, the revelation of God the Father, because the Father dwells in unapproachable light. He is not seen or able to be seen, says the Bible. The young man looked at me like no one had ever asked him that before. Any new claimants to add addition to this all-sufficient revelation in the Word of God are by nature untrue and they are there to lead you astray. It begs the question, how, I mean, sure, when I stand up here and I portray it, it sounds to you like, duh, right? Absolutely. How could we ever be led astray? It's so stupid. But thousands are. Thousands are being led astray. You know, the, and this is, this is simply undeniable. The mission field of these pseudo-Christian cults, I've mentioned Mormonism, I've mentioned Jehovah's Witness, the list is quite long, let's leave it at that. Their mission field, without doubt, where they get the greatest harvest for their organizations is autopilot evangelicalism. That's where it is. Where people go to church, don't think for himself, don't study the word for himself, just expect some authority figure to stand up here and tell them everything the Bible says and they engage with no effort and they will soon be led astray. We put no confidence in man or the arguments of man. Our confidence is always in the word of God. But let me give you a few reasons why people are led astray. I've got three and with this we'll close out our time here together this morning. The first reason or the first way in which people are led astray is because of overconfidence in their standing. If just now when I said thousands are led astray all the time to these pseudo-Christian organizations, if your initial reaction was, could never be me. I have a verse for you. I have a verse that Paul wrote to the Corinthians in fact, let's turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to read this, a few verses here with you. I want you to read along with me. Paul wrote this, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the age has come. So, so friend, just before we go on, let's get a sense of this, that with this, with this unhealthy amount of confidence that we often carry ourselves with, that we are quite sure, we, we often think this way, I, I, I know you don't 
perhaps confess it, but we often think this way, that if we were in the wilderness and we saw all that, we saw, we saw the, the ocean open and walk across on dry land of the Red Sea, we saw the, the chariots and the, the military of Egypt flooded by the same water, if we saw food every day lying all over the ground and, and we saw a rock that was just gushing out fresh, clean water and we saw a, a pillar of fire by night warming us and keeping us in safety and we saw a, a cloud by day protecting us from the harshness of the sun and the elements, if we saw all that we wouldn't be led astray. But don't you see that's exactly why Paul writes this to the Corinthians. It is overconfidence in your standing which demonstrates how great a weakness you have in your standing. That's why he says all this is there for our example. And verse 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. One of the main reasons... Why believers are led astray is because of overconfidence in their standing. They don't believe it could ever happen to them. They, they, don't ever allow for the, they don't ever allow for the reality that they need to take heed that their standing is secure in Christ. Not to just assume. You remember the earlier analogy we talked about? About wading out into the water and, and the riptide and, and the way the flow of the ocean is. that You may feel like if you were to look up at that shoreline, you would see that flag and you are confident that you have not felt yourself move. We're overconfident. We're overconfident. Such that when we do look up and we see the flag at a vast distance and we wonder, how could that even be possible? How could that happen to me? Overconfidence in your standing is a weakness which undermines many. I'm not asking that you should have an anxiousness about falling away. That's not what the Bible says. But not to be cavalier or arrogant in your attitude and assume invincibility. Let me ask this. Where is the confidence of our standing? Where is it, of course, it's in Jesus Christ and the permanence of his altar. We read it already. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The great Scottish preacher, Robert Murray Machane, once wrote this. He said, for every look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. You are weak and ready to be snatched away into heresy if you feel invincible. Take heed when you think you stand. Paul said, lest you fall. We should always approach with the humility that says, I am not strong enough. I am not smart enough. I am not good enough. If I'm going to be safe and secure in the gospel of Christ who is God, it is by looking unto Jesus and placing no confidence in myself or my flesh. It's the first way people are susceptible to being led astray by strange and diverse teachings. If you want to be saved, look away from yourself and look to Jesus. If you want to be assured of your salvation, look away from yourself and look to Jesus. If you want security in your salvation, look away from yourself and look to Jesus. The second reason why Christians are led astray is a fetish for the unusual. We spoke about this earlier. A fetish for the unusual. The New Testament has a long list of stern warnings about being the person who always pursues obscure pieces of knowledge and fetishes for unusual doctrine. And this is rampant in modern evangelicalism. Let me read you a few of these admonitions in Scripture. I'm going to race through these quickly. If you want to read these for yourself, I recommend you note the reference down and read later. Titus 3.9 says this, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, arguments, and quarrels about the law, because these things are pointless and worthless. 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 4 says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may change some, that they teach no other doctrine." nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith. 2 Timothy 2.14, Paul wrote this, Remind the believers of these things, charge them before God to avoid quarreling over words, 
that is in no way profitable leads its listeners to ruin. One more, 2 Timothy 2.23, but reject foolish and ignorant speculation, for you know that it breeds quarreling. We've all seen our fair share of this. Fair share of this. It's tragic. But it comes into churches and it spoils them. It divides them and it ruins them. For some people, they get like this because, firstly, they're not satisfied with Jesus. They want more. They're addicted to the feeling of always having secret knowledge, always chasing the next fix. Well, they're proud and they just always need to have the insight, the unique insight, the, the information that others don't have. They, they want to walk around with a, with a chest puffed out saying, I know more than you. The Bible is not silent on this. And this is how people get led astray. There's a fetish for it. There's, there, there's, a, certain, there's a certain desirability to this that can unlock the secret mysteries of the Bible to be that guy or to at least to self-proclaim as being that guy. We have to realize the Bible tells us to be aware of those inward manifestations of our sinful nature, to always be the one to know. The next one, this is my last one, a preference. Now, this is going to step on some toes, so I, I pause before I say this. So our third reason why people are led astray is a preference for extra scriptural sources of encouragement, edification a preference so you may not be the one who has a fetish for the obscure who always leads to destruction but you may be unwittingly in just as much danger if you are spending more of your time and attention devoting your focus and feeding your soul on things that claim to be sourced from the bible but are not in fact the bible I've got a confession to make. I hope you'll bear with me for one more personal confession. I used to work in a Christian bookstore, and I was, a, I was really bad at it. I didn't put it on my resume when I applied for the job here. Maybe I should have. I was really bad at it. You know, people would come in, and they expected good help from salespeople. And I, I, I thought I was good help, but evidently I certainly wasn't. People would come in and they'd, they'd approach the counter and they'd see me standing there with my, my uniform on and my tie on and my name badge. And they'd say, hey, excuse me, sir, I, I'm looking for a certain book. They'd begin to describe this book they're looking for. Sometimes, sometimes they had a book in mind, like they just couldn't remember the name, the title, or the author, or both. And so they're describing the book. Or sometimes they just come in saying, I, I'm looking for something that speaks to raising teenagers, or I, I want something that helps me deal with serving communion in the church. Any, any kind of idea, anything at all. And I'd stand there and they would go on this long tirade about the features and the attributes of this incredible book. And the whole time I'd be like, yeah, I know the book. I know the exact book, the perfect book for you. And they'd be surprised, they'd be surprised, like, really? Yeah, you're good at this. So I would, every single one, I would walk them over to the Bibles. That's, that's the book, right? That's, you want a book on healing? You want a book on salvation? You want a book on the history of Israel? You want a book on the New Testament church? You want a book on how to serve communion, how to be steward with your money? You want a book? It's there. That's the book. I wasn't very good at selling books. I, I remember people would just, in a fit, in a steam of rage, would storm out of the store. I remember this one person, like, with this one person had a lot of generosity. They just assumed I misunderstood. It's not always a safe assumption with me. So they assumed I misunderstood. Oh, no, 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 I'm, no, I'm looking, for, I'm looking for the 12 love languages and seven keys to your best life now. I'd say, it's called the New Testament. And this person was very generous, very patient with me. They said, no, 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 no. No, I'm sure it was published in 2012 by Zonda, whatever. And I'd, I'd stop them and say, look, let me just level with you. Every other book, every other book in this Christian bookstore, we... We had great books and we had atrocious books. That's, the, that's a lot of times what Christian bookstores are like. I said, every other book in this store claims to derive its best content from this book alone. Go to the source. Now, don't get me wrong. I love reading. I read vast, wide, 
broadly, I love to read. I recommend you to read. We have a resource center for that very purpose. My point here is, put away all other books and just read the Bible. That's dumb. Fundamentalism. I'm not recommending that. It, it doesn't come across as strongly when Craig says it. Let me give you Spurgeon. Can I quote you Spurgeon? Right. Spurgeon said this. Spurgeon says, the person that will not use the brains of other people proves they have no brains of their own. <laughs> that's fairly, that's, thank you Spurgeon, that's fairly well put. In other words, if you do not use the gifts, the callings, what God has granted other people, and they write it in good books, you should buy them, you should read them, you should enjoy them. My point right now is not to avoid good Christian resources. My point is where does the majority of the sustenance of your soul come from? That's my point. My point is if the majority of edification you get is not the Bible, but it's other books that claim to be regurgitating the Bible for you, I want to encourage you that often people are led astray when good Christian books have in them small scintilla amounts of error which over time ruins their soul. The only book that has no error in it at all is the Bible. You can never overdo your love for reading of and appreciation of the Bible. Please read good Christian books. In fact, we know in the New Testament that Paul loved reading other books apart from the Bible. And he shows us a recommendation of that. But let me read you this. We'll close out on this thought. I know this has stood on some toes and I'm glad it has for your edification. It says this. A preference for and even a preoccupation with extra biblical material tethers you to man's wisdom. Or at best, it tethers you to man's interpretation of biblical truth. This will, after a period of time, if it replaces your love for and reading of Scripture, this will, after a period of time, it will wean you off the Bible. Which is only, the only true anchor of your soul. Go back with me to Hebrews chapter 13. We'll close this out. So many ways that this content could be misunderstood, but I, I trust you understand my heart and the emphasis I'm trying to draw here. Verse 8, Hebrews 13. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be led astray. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Don't be led astray. Don't be led away. Don't be coerced and coaxed. Don't be overconfident in your standing. Often look up while you're in that, in that water, the riptide of the, the world we live in. Often look up to the standard of our faith, the exemplar of our faith, Jesus Christ. And realize that those that are often led away by diverse and strange teachings are the ones who have undervalued the place, the power, and the importance of the Word of God in their life. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And we're going to pray that God would seal this Word to our heart and bring this Word to fruition in our lives. I want to let you know here as we bow our head and close our eyes that at the close of our service here we have one of our members who's requested prayer for healing with the elders anointing with oil according to James chapter 5 and we'll be conducting that service briefly. If you're here with an illness, we want the elders to pray over you and to minister to you in that way. The elders are here to do that. We have oil ready. Uh, we already have one person who's requested that. And if you're here and you want prayer, would you come and join us at the end of our service? We normally do that in the last song, but we're going to hold that off to the end of our service this morning so we can do that all together. And you're welcome to stay by God's grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that your word speaks life unto us. We thank you, Lord, that your word is all sufficient. It's all satisfying. We love the fact, God, that you've given us so many other ways that we can be 
We can be granted grace. We can be filled with the Spirit. We can be grown in our, our knowledge and, and understanding of Jesus. But Father, your Word is the principal source of all of that. I pray you help us to love the Word supremely. I pray you help us to be in the Word principally. I pray you help us to hold the Word up and, and, and elevate it above all other things as we ought in our heart and our life. Because so often we're like that, like that six-year-old who's, who's waist deep in the ocean and they, they're playing around and they're fooling around and they have no idea the danger that they're in because the riptide is just so, so quickly pulling them away from the mark, from the standard, from the original spot. God, that's all of us. And if we, if we don't recognize that we are susceptible in and of ourselves that we don't place our confidence where it ought to be, which is in Christ Jesus, who is the same yesterday, he is the same today, he will be the same forever. God, help us to know that we are all at risk. The Bible says such. And the only way we, the only way we repel that risk is to live lives in humility and dependence upon your word and the gospel of your son. God, I pray right now this morning, if there are any here who have drifted from Jesus or don't know Jesus as they ought, they don't have a sense of forgiveness of their sins, would you right now in this moment draw them to Christ? May they know right now that all they need do is place their trust in Jesus and they are saved. That they receive him. That they receive him by grace through faith. I pray you bless this word to our lives. May it bear much fruit and glorify your name. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you...